Good slightly afternoon. Hi, I'm Timmy, Executive Director of the Historical Society. And as usual, we thank uh, the Community Media Center for being here to tape today. And we have Stephanie at the controls. So thank you, Stephanie. And thanks to uh, New Windsor State Bank, who is picking up the freight on rental here at the uh, American Legion. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is that as of January, the Legion has tripled our rent for the BLTs. And we have looked around for other venues and posts notwithstanding. We really think that this is the most convenient location, so we're sticking it out for another year. Um, the bad news to members is that we are, they've tripled us, we're doubling you. <laughs> to two dollars per luncheon. I hope you can find it in your pockets to keep coming at two dollars a lecture. And I think you know it's worth it. I am really delighted to be introducing Tim Smith today. He is a graduate of Westminster High School. Yay! And he has been a licensed battlefield guide at Gettysburg National Military Park since 1992, so he ought to know his stuff. He is the reference historian at the Adams County Historical Society, and he is also an instructor for the Gettysburg Elder Hostel and has taught credit and non-credit classes on the Battle of Gettysburg and local history at local community colleges. He is a frequent lecturer at Civil War seminars, including our very own Maryland and the Civil War Conference and at Civil War Roundtables. He's written numerous articles on the battle, is the author of the story of Lee's headquarters, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and John Burns, the hero of Gettysburg, and co-author of Devil's Den, a history and guide. And he has brought some material with him that you can see after his lecture. So please welcome Tim Smith. Okay. Testing. Testing. I'm on. Okay. Actually, uh, I have uh, seven other books, and um, I'm kind of the book. I guess uh, what I'm going to be speaking on today is a, a combination of several of the books that I've written. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, the citizens of the town of Gettysburg and the area around the town at the time of the Civil War, and um, you know. I've been a licensed battlefield guide for quite a long time, and even before that, I was interested in uh, the battle. And of course, most people are interested in battle or interested in the military aspects of the battle, the fighting that took place and the units that were involved in the fighting. And I think I noticed early on that when histories of the battle talked about the civilians that lived on the battlefield, they kind of relegated it to a human interest story, as if the story of the people that lived on the battlefield where the fighting took place is not connected with the actual battle. It's kind of a side story. And um, what I've tried to do over the years, I guess, by talking about the civilians that lived in the area is try to get people to understand that the story of the civilians that lived there is the story of the battle, just through the eyes of the people that live there. And they have an interesting perspective of the fighting that took place. A lot of times also, when, um, and I, I guess some military historians, and don't get me wrong, I've been studying the battle all my life, but some strictly military historians accuse me of being a social historian. <laughs> 
and that you know that um, that and, and I notice a lot of military histories downplay the accounts of the civilians as if they're not as accurate as the soldiers. But you know when you study the accounts of the civilians, the people that live there they know the name of the stream. They know the name of the hill. They know whose property the battle's being fought on. They know the name of the street. So I find that when you read their accounts of the battle, oftentimes they're actually more accurate than the soldiers that were involved in the fighting. Because the soldier doesn't know whose property he's on. He doesn't know where the, what fence he's fighting behind or what stream or what hill he is on. So I would just suggest this, that we should look at the battle and study all the aspects of the battle and try to study them all and bring them together as one story instead of isolating the stories. Now, also, I want to make, make uh, clear that I'm not one of those people that uh, has to champion the story of the Gettysburg civilians. I do not believe in promoting a certain group of people and calling them heroes or heroines. The people that lived in Gettysburg are not heroes and heroines. They are people that were thrown into a situation that they did not ask to be in, that they did not want to be in, and they dealt with it as best as they could. And some people dealt with it very well. And some people didn't deal with it well at all. So, you know, you just got to try to understand that the people who live there are people just like us. And uh, I just wanted to get that across. Let me tell you a little bit about the town. Uh, the town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, um, of course, is 10 miles north of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, the area around Gettysburg uh, was first settled by Scotch-Irish and German immigrants that mostly came out from the area of Philadelphia and settled across through Chester and Lancaster and York and Adams. We did have some Irish move into South Central Pennsylvania coming up from Maryland. And uh, there were Catholics that moved north. But uh, by and large, these are Scotch, Irish, and German immigrants that have come in from the east. Uh, in 17, in the 1760s, I, should, I guess I should say, there was a guy named Samuel Geddes that established a tavern at an intersection of two roads, the York-Nichols Gap Road and the Baltimore-Shippensburg Road. Uh, he got in some financial trouble after the American Revolution, and his property was sheriffed. And at a sheriff's sale in 1785, his son, James Geddes, purchased 116 acres of land, he laid out 210-town lots around the intersection where his father's tavern and home was located, and he established the town that we call Gettysburg. Now, sometimes I, not being from there originally, I do slip into calling it Gettysburg, but it actually is James Geddes, and it should be pronounced Gettysburg. Here's a... Um, original draft of 116 acres of land around that intersection. And the York-Nichols Gap Road, which runs from basically York, Pennsylvania, across towards Emmitsburg, uh, you know, a little over and down, uh, that road was laid out in 1747. And the Black's Gap Road on this map, or what we refer to as the Baltimore-Shippensburg Road, was laid out in 1769. And it was that intersection that was the reason that the battle was fought in Gettysburg. By 1800, Gettysburg had become the county seat of the newly formed Adams County. It was formed out of the western townships of York County, which had been formed out of the western townships of Lancaster County. And I, I won't go any farther, you get the idea. <laughs> Gettysburg was the county seat it was the center of industry and commerce in our area up there. And by the time of the Civil War, a network of roads were established at the town, connecting it to all the other towns in the area. As a matter of fact, you often hear 10 roads intersected at the town. That is the number one major reason why the battle is fought there, because all the roads lead there. And as the troops were marching through the area, they could not avoid the road hub. It begins and ends there. 
That's why the battle's fought. And if you read the reports of the armies prior to the fighting, you know, they constantly are talking about the town of Gettysburg or Gettysburg. I can't say it right. So um, here's a map to give you an idea of uh, the more prominent towns in the area at the time of the Civil War. And I took the liberty of using a map that's from Harper's Weekly. And I think it's like July 22nd, 1863. So this is an 1863 map. Obviously, Gettysburg or Gettysburg would not be a prominent town until after the battle. You see how they got the name real big there. They're trying to show you where it is in relationship to the other areas. And I put on there the Mason-Dixon line, the uh, imaginary line between the north and the south, but the actual line between free state Pennsylvania and slave state Maryland. And you can see uh, the town with all the other nearest major towns. And, of course, down here we have uh, Baltimore, and I put Westminster on the map for us. And there's uh, Frederick, Hagerstown, Chambersburg, Carlisle, Harrisburg, and York. And you see that these roads coming out of the town lead to all these other places. You've got to get an idea. At the outbreak of the Civil War, the town had a population of about 2,000 people. Um, we had two institutes of higher learning. The Pennsylvania College, which of course is today called Gettysburg College, the Lutheran Theological Seminary in the fields west of the town. There were six major hotels in the town. Since all the roads led to that place, it was often used as an overnight stop by people who were traveling, for instance, from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh or from points south to points north. The Eagle Hotel was the most prominent hotel in the town at the time of the Civil War. Uh, the Eagle Hotel is no longer standing. It burned in a fire uh, on, in 1960. So for those who are familiar with the town, today a 7-Eleven is at that location. <laughs> at the intersection of uh, Chambersburg Street and Washington Street. But you can still see a plaque that shows you where it was. Now, at the time of the battle, the town, like any other town, had businesses like you might expect to find in a county seat. We had a courthouse, and we had lawyers, and we had a lot of offices and businesses. Uh, there were eight different churches in the town, different denominations, uh, because, of course, it was Pennsylvania, and uh, one of William Penn's uh, ideas about Pennsylvania was that people of all different religious denominations could live together. Uh, we have a lot of different denominations. And so there's churches all over the town. Uh, but also, we had a thriving carriage industry. And a lot of the professions, uh, this is an 1858 list of the businesses in the town, have, they deal with the carriage industry. Of course, Gettysburg's, Gettysburg's or Gettysburg's carriage industry is tied into a southern market. They were actually making a very fine carriage that was being sold uh, down the Shenandoah Valley or up the Shenandoah Valley, on your, depending on your perspective. So we, um, uh, the outbreak of the Civil War destroyed uh, the businesses in Gettysburg that were involved in the carriage-making industry. Now, we have a few photographs of the town that were taken immediately after the fighting, so you can kind of get an idea of um, what the town looked like. And over the years, I, I guess there's about 400 houses in the town at the time of the battle. And I know that because in the 1860 census, they, they put uh, the dwelling number and the families that lived in them in the census, so about 400 uh, families occupied the, the borders of the town. And over the years, the Adams County Historical Society has tried to create uh, maps and resources to identify each of the structures that were standing in the town at the time of the battle. And, you know, this was started early on. 
Uh, some of you probably know when you go up to our town, there are buildings in the town that have plaques on them. And the plaques say, Civil War Building, July 1863. So you can kind of get an idea which buildings were there at the time and which ones, which ones were not there at the time. And over the years since that project, different people have tried to carry this further and identify exactly who lived in the different buildings in the town and which ones were, when they were built and when they were torn down. So we have a pretty good base of people that are studying the town at the time of the Civil War. Was there a shoe factory there? Oh, good question. There was no shoe factory in the town of Gettysburg, and the Southerners were not coming to Gettysburg to get shoes. I just like to throw that out like that. <laughs> obviously, obviously, that's a question we get a lot. And that's why I made a big deal about the road hub. The shoe factory is sort of a myth that was started by General Henry Heath when he wrote his memoirs after the war. And I think he might have started it in a Philadelphia Weekly Press article where he was trying to explain why it was that his men came to Gettysburg uh, when supposedly Lee had ordered the army not to bring on a general engagement until the army was assembled. So he's trying to explain why it was that he got involved in a fight at Gettysburg before the Southern Army commander was ready to fight a battle, and he came with this idea that, oh, I heard there were sho shoes in Gettysburg. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I was going to Gettysburg to get those shoes. <laughs> but beyond all that, the fact is we do not have a shoe factory and they weren't coming to get shoes. So, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's much, much more to it than that. Now, oh, you know, the thing about the shoe factory, I should say, avoid, it, it kind of, the one thing that's interesting about it is it kind of ignores the fact that Robert E. Lee had ordered for the concentration of the Confederate Army at the town of Gettysburg on June 28th. So it kind of ignores that, that fact there. And that Heath is actually moving towards the town because Lee had ordered for the concentration of the army. The outbreak of the American Civil War affected Gettysburg like many other towns, north and south, all across the country. Men from the town joined the army. And, you know, throughout the course of the war, in our, you know, much like this area in Adams County, um, we had like 3,000 men serve in the Union armies. Now, perhaps... Perhaps there were like five that served in the Southern Army. And we don't have a real, it's a northern town. We don't have a high percentage. Uh, I know Westminster, uh, I, you know, I never, if I remember correctly, I don't remember if it's Carroll County figure in total or Westminster's 200 or something like that in the Confederate Army. It might be for the whole county. Um, but even though, you know, it's a northern, Adams County is a northern county, and they wholeheartedly support the Northern cause, they do not appreciate the fact that we are at war. And they would rather there not be a war. Unlike other areas, the war has devastated the um, uh, you know, economy because most of the economy is tied into the markets at Baltimore or with the Shenandoah Valley. And the um, people who live in Adams County are predominantly Democratic, uh, and opposed to the Lincoln administration. Um, Lincoln did carry Adams County in the 1860 election, but McClellan would carry Adams County in 1864, and the Democrats dominated in the 1862 elections, uh, in the midterm elections. Um, and, you know, most people are not excited about the war. They would rather there not be a war. And, of course, over the years, you understand that if you are not in favor of the war, some people tend to perceive you as being supportive of the enemy. And we'll talk about that coming up at the end here. But in 1862, because our local population does not support the war effort, a draft is imposed upon Adams County. In October of 1862, 800 men from the county were drafted into the 165th Pennsylvania Drafted Militia. They were drafted into the Army. They were sent to Suffolk, Virginia, down near Norfolk. Norfolk. They were guarding the railroad leading into the Great Dismal Swamp. And, of course, they were not here in 1863 when a Confederate army marched through Adams County. So they were not there with their wives and their families to um, offer any support or protection. 
Now, also in 1862 in October, after following the Battle of Antietam, of course, Jeb Stuart raided through Maryland into Pennsylvania. He led a column of some, uh, I believe, some uh, 1,800 men and rode through Mercersburg, St. Thomas. He camped at Chambersburg on the night of October 10th, rode over the South Mountain Range into Cash Town and Fairfield and rode through Emmitsburg. He passed within six miles of Gettysburg. And he gathered hundreds of horses and supplies and threw the area into a panic. There were several scares or panics in the area prior to the raid that we call the Gettysburg Campaign. Living only 10 miles south or north of the Mason-Dixon line, I should say, um, there was a constant threat that the Southern Army might invade this area. And of course, in the summer of 1863, Robert E. Lee's forces marched west, north through Maryland and Pennsylvania. They scattered their forces across the Pennsylvania countryside, gathering supplies and provisions. The Northern Army was still in Virginia when the Southern Army reached Pennsylvania. Think about this. This is something people don't talk about much. The Southern Army, the advanced elements reached Chambersburg, Pennsylvania on June 15th. The Northern Army did not reach the outskirts of the town until June 30th. For two weeks, the Southern Army was marching back and forth across south-central Pennsylvania, gathering supplies and provisions and throwing a huge scare into the local population. On June 26th, the Friday prior to the battle, the Southern Army marched through Gettysburg. General Juba Early captured the town, and he demanded supplies and provisions. And he demanded shoes is on his list. Here's actually a picture of the list that he asked. Uh, one is two-sided, but one, one side of it, a thousand pairs of shoes. Yeah, 500 hats. I like this, 40 barrels of sauerkraut. Yeah, it's hard to read. Flour. But he asked for a bunch of stuff. Or in lieu of $10,000 in cash. The local people, uh, don't. The, the, the shop owners had realized the southerners were in the area. They put all their goods onto trains. They sent them east. And the town was unable to fill Jubal Early's demands. But Jubal Early, Early the next morning, uh, on the 27th, left Gettysburg. On June 28th, he captured York. And he got, you know, he, he was paid about $28,000 from the people of York. On the evening of June 28th, Juber Early's forces burned the bridge across the, well, I should actually say they captured Wrightsville. The Federals burned the bridge uh, leading from Wrightsville to Columbia. And the Southern Army, of course, halted their advance there and did not enter Lancaster County. Prior to the battle, the Southern Army had invaded Chambersburg. Some of them marched through the town. They marched to York. Some of the Southern Army marched to Carlisle. They captured Carlisle. They threatened Harrisburg, the state capital. But two days before the battle, Lee learned that the Northern Army had reached Frederick, Maryland, and they were approaching they would march through Westminster, through Tawnytown, through Emmitsburg, and they were marching on Pennsylvania. So Lee decided to order for the concentration of his army. Robert E. Lee pulls out a map. He sees that 10 roads intersected to town, and he orders for his army to concentrate there. Now, Lee had hoped that he would concentrate his force and then prepare for a battle. But unfortunately for Lee, the northern army marched a little quicker than he anticipated. On the evening of June 30th, John Buford's Union Cavalry Force arrived in Gettysburg, uh, some 3,000 men, and he positioned themselves in the fields west and north of the town. The town was beside itself. Protection had finally arrived. And the girls of the town came out onto the streets and sang, uh, apparently it was very impromptu, Groups of girls got together on each of the street corners and they sang as the soldiers came into the town, the cavalry troopers. Uh, we refer to the incident as the singing girls. And it was a remarkable incident, not just for the citizens, but for the soldiers. These men had been in Virginia. 
No one was singing or cheering them as they were going through these towns. And here they were in a northern town and the northern population was happy to see them. And everyone, civilian and soldier alike, writes about it. Probably the most interesting thing uh, from the civilian perspective is that in 1903, at the 40th anniversary of the battle, some of the cavalry troopers are in town putting up a monument, and they go downtown and they ask about some of these girls, and they round up as many as they can. I think they get 16 of them, and they get them into the square of Gettysburg, And these girls sing for the soldiers. And then after that, every year, there was a little reunion between the soldiers and the singing girls. And they would sing once again for the soldiers until all the girls and veterans died off. It lasted, it didn't last, it lasted, I think the last one I saw was like uh, 1914. And then there wasn't enough girls to sing. So um, the first day of the battle was fought in the fields west and north of the town. And, of course, you know, on the first day of the battle, the south arrived quicker with more men. The north is coming from the south. The south is coming from the north. On the first day of the battle, they drove the northern army through the town and back onto the hill south of it. The citizens did not know what to do. Try to imagine people living in this town. And, you know, on June 26, Juba Early's men marched through the town. And Gordon's brigade came right through the center of the, the, the town. That's about 2,000 men. That was probably more men than they'd ever seen in their entire lives in one place. And then, a few days later, Buford's guys come into the town. 3,000 of them ride through the town. And on the morning of July 1st, the Union Army marches across the fields and through the town to get to the area of the first day's battlefield. And... Civilians are lined up along the streets watching uh, the 11th Army Corps came right through the middle of the town. You know, something like six or 7,000 men came right up the street through the town. And it, w- it was a staggering um, display of power. The citizens did not expect in a few hours that all these men would be driven through the town and would be fighting in the streets. There was a sense of calm after the soldiers arrived. And the civilians, many of them at the western outskirts of the town where the fighting had been raging, had fled into the center or onto the southern edge of town. But um, not a lot of civilians left. They kind of stayed there. Now, some did. And some put their family's possession in their wagons and fled south or east. But at least, we're not sure the percentage, but it seems like more than half of the citizens just stayed in the town and they didn't know what to do. There was heavy fighting in the fields west of the town. This is the Edward McPherson farm along the Chambersburg Pike. It would be on this farm on the morning of July 1st that one of the citizens of the town would take matters into his own hands. John Burns was 69 years old. He obtained a musket. He went out onto the battlefield. He joined in the firing line. He, when the fighting started in the afternoon action, he stayed with the army. Everyone thought he would run. He reloaded and fired his musket as best he could. He was wounded three times in the fighting. And as the northern army was driven back, he was left on the battlefield. He spent the night on the battlefield. Uh, the southerners found him, asked him what he was doing out there. He told him he lost his cow. <laughs> Couldn't find that cow anywhere. They thought he was nuts. They let him go. He crawled to a nearby house, got a wagon to take him back into town. Um, He survived the battle. He survived the war, and he went on to become somewhat of a national celebrity. Four months after the battle, when Abraham Lincoln came to give the famous Gettysburg Address, he wanted to meet John Burns. He shook his hand in front of dozens of reporters. Congress passed a special pension for John Burns. <laughs> Bret Hart wrote a poem about him. N.C. Wyeth did an illustration of him. And, of course, I like to point out that I am his biographer. <laughs> yes. So he was the only citizen of the town to actually run out and fight in the battle. 
Although I should mention, there were other civilians in the town that were in the army at that time that were in the battle. But this guy actually ran out and fought in the battle. Of course, I'm not here to suggest that's a good idea. (laughs) What do you think the more stable citizens of Gettysburg are at that moment? Yeah, (laughs) hiding in their cellars. And on the afternoon of the first day, the northern army was literally driven through the town. And the southern army was closing in on the town from the west, the north, and the south. And here, next time you ride through the town, I just want you to think about this, because this is something we don't talk about a lot. 18,000 northern soldiers retreated through the town. 30,000 southerners were chasing them. 2,000 people were hiding in their cellars, and all the roads lead to one spot in the center of the town. What was that like? It was chaos. There is no way to describe how bad it was. And the citizens didn't know what to do. The southern army overran and captured the town. But the northern army rallied on Cemetery Hill that night. And, of course, throughout the course of the evening of the second day, or the evening of the first day, morning of the second, more and more northern soldiers would arrive. And that position would be strongly held. And, of course, since we're here, I can't help but mention that the 6th Army Corps left Manchester, Maryland, about 10 p.m., 16,000 men. They marched to Westminster. They marched up Main Street here. They came right in from the, is that called the old Manchester Road right there? Mm -hmm. They came right down the street there, but they missed a turn at Vince's Seafood, and he went straight. (laughs) And so the head of the column then turned onto uh, Meadow Branch Road. That's before the airport cut off Meadow Branch, and they went out, they came out on the Baltimore Pike, and they walked to Gettysburg. They walked during the night 32 miles in 17 hours to get to Gettysburg. And so the Union Army held and had a strong position on the hills south of the town. All the churches in town were used as hospitals. And during the second and the third day, keep this in mind, all the northern hospitals, all the wounded northern soldiers that had come into the town, now they were behind the southern line of battle. And there were no northern soldiers to help a lot of the wounded. Doctors remained behind But it was the girls that lived in the town that came out of their homes and went to the churches around them and cared for the soldiers. The Powers girls are probably the most uh, striking example of this. I think my, oh, there it is. There were six girls, Power sisters. One of them would die after the war, so when I share the photograph, there's only five of them. But they actually went out in the streets. They gathered wounded northern soldiers off the streets, and they brought them into their house, and they nursed these soldiers back to health. If these girls don't go out and help these wounded, who is going to help them? And these girls saved men's lives. And after the war, the Powers girls became somewhat of local heroes, or heroines, I should say. Um, There were photographs taken of them, Every reunion, the soldiers went to visit them. At the time of the battle, they were all in their teens and 20s. They were all uh, closely aged. Uh, Solomon Powers didn't have any sons. He had all daughters. And so here's a photograph uh, that appears in a history of the battle in the early 1900s. Oh, I'm sorry. There they are. So I guess it doesn't do them justice. (laughs) from a book. Yeah, I like their hair. So Sally Myers actually has an interesting story. She, she uh, cares for the wounded soldiers. On July 2nd, while the Southern Army occupied the town, she comes out of her house. At the time of the battle, she was a 21-year-old school teacher. She was a local teacher at the Gettysburg Public School. She went to the Catholic Church And inside the door, there was all these wounded soldiers. And she walked over to one uh, and asked if she could help him in some way. There were no nurses there. There were just a couple doctors trying to care, amputate limbs. 
And he said, no, I'm afraid there's nothing you can do for me. I'm going to die. And she ran out. And she sat on the church steps and she cried. And then she thought about it and she thought, well, if she doesn't go back in, there's nobody else. So she went back in and she, she helped these soldiers. She changed the wounds as many as she could. She brought six of the soldiers into her house a couple doors away. And that soldier she initially talked to died in her arms. So after the battle, she wrote a letter to his father and his wife and telling them how his last thoughts were with them or were of them. His father came to, get, came to Gettysburg after the battle, recovered his son's body, was immediately taken by Sally, went back home, brought his other son. <laughs> they fell in love, and they were married. <laughs> but they were only married uh, less than a year when he died. But she was pregnant. And her son, Henry Stort, became the president of the Adams County Historical Society, (laughs) where I work. So that's how we know the story. Oh, I wanted to show you their father. (laughs) Solomon Powers was one of the town's greatest Samaritans. Yes. And so you have to see Solomon Powers. And he has, I'm sure he's upset because he doesn't have any boys. <laughs> I should mention that five of the six girls did marry. So one of, one of the soldiers asked one of the girls to marry him. But she was betrothed to another, and she turned him down. On the second and third day of the battle, there was heavy fighting in the fields south of the town. The southern army occupied the edge of the town, and they fired up at Cemetery Hill, and the northern army fired back. And for two days, men were firing back and forth at each other, and civilians are in the basements of these houses caught in, as we titled this, in the eye of the storm. And of course, on the morning of the third day of the battle, a 20-year-old girl was baking bread for the soldiers when a stray bullet went up the street, went through the side door of the house, and struck her in the back. And Jenny Wade is the only citizen of the town to be killed during the actual fighting. And, of course, she was not in her cellar. There's a cellar door there. But her sister, this is her sister's house, her sister had given birth to a child on June 26th, the Friday before the battle. And and the sister wasn't doing very well, so she was in a bed in the parlor, and they were not moving her. And so the family did not go to the cellar. The family stayed upstairs, and she felt, you know, the need to bake bread and was killed in the fighting. Now, there were other civilian casualties. There were civilians wounded, like John Burns. There were about 10 civilians taken prisoner by Lee's army for various reasons and spent time in prison camp. And there were civilians that died immediately after the fighting. There were a few little kids that died in the town because of unexploded ordnance that was discovered on the battlefield. On July 5th, one of the boys in town was led outside, picked up a rifle, immediately turned and shot and killed his little brother. I think it was a five-year-old killing a three-year-old. So there were accidents, but Jenny Wade was the only person killed in the town during the fighting, only civilian. And, of course, in 1901, her house became a museum. And today, the Jenny Wade House Museum is the oldest continuously operational museum in the town. Now, there was heavy fighting in the field south of the town, on the farms. And, of course, um, I wrote a book for the Adams County Historical Society, so the money goes to them. And the book is Farms at Gettysburg, in which I talk about some of the farmers around the battlefield. The Trossel Farm, Abraham Trossel. 45 horses were killed in the Trossel's front yard in front of the house. The barn, the house is right over there. What did he do with the dead horses after the battle? Burned them. But they didn't burn them until three weeks after the battle. It was a horrible situation around the town and the battlefield. There were thousands of men killed and they had to be buried. It took a week to bury the bodies. 
horses killed by the military? Yes. Well, of course, the, those horses there were killed because the Southerners were trying to overrun a Union artillery unit. That, one, that was not their horses. That was artillery horses uh, belonging to an artillery unit. This is uh, Peter Rogers and his wife, Suzanne. And since I'm really into the citizens, I go around town and I talk to people that still live in the town that are related to the people that lived there at the time, and I collect photographs, much like other people collect photographs of generals that were in the battle. I like to collect the civilians. And I was really, I always wanted a picture of Peter Rogers because I was a big fan of Grandpa Munster. <laughs> but uh, this is Peter Rogers and his wife. I don't think she has teeth. Um, they lived on a farmhouse on the Emmitsburg Road. Peter stayed there at the house with his um, adopted daughter, Josephine. And during the heavy fighting on July 2nd, Josephine made uh, baked bread and made a meal for the soldiers. And um, after the fighting was over, uh, she cared for the wounded. During Pickett's charge, she huddled in the cellar of the house with wounded northern soldiers while Pickett's division charged around both sides of her house. The Union Army fired artillery shells directly at her house, and artillery shells are flying through the house while she's in the basement caring for the wounded. When the soldiers wanted to place a monument in the 1880s to mark the spot where the first Massachusetts was involved in the fighting, they wanted to have Josephine at the ceremony. Many of the soldiers believed that they were alive because of her, that she had saved their lives. So, unfortunately, she had married and moved to Ohio. But the Massachusetts soldiers tracked her down and paid the expenses for her and her family to return to Gettysburg and attend the ceremony. And at the dedication photograph in 1886, she is prominently featured in front of the veterans. And then, I like to say, in what must have been a flash of creative excitement, the house that she baked the bread in was being torn down, and a new one was being built in its place. The veterans went over to the old summer kitchen, and they took the stove out. They put it in front of the monument, and she baked bread for everyone. <laughs> Do you think baking bread for soldiers is important? The soldiers thought it was. So it doesn't matter what we think. It made a big impact on them that these people uh, were helping out. That's a nice piece of bread, isn't it? Oh, I wanted to mention that a few years ago, I'd always been interested in Josephine Miller, and I got this particular photograph from her great, oh, actually, it's a great, great, she's adopted, so it's like her um, stepbrother's, or would it be foster brother's family, one of the great, great granddaughters. But um, I found in a flea market a photograph album in Gettysburg with a picture of her when she was young. So here's an 1865 photograph of Josephine Miller, and it was written on it, the famous battlefield girl. <laughs> she died in Troy, Ohio. John Rose. John Rose lived on a farm on the southern end of the battlefield. It was owned by his brother, his brother George. They had 230 acres. On the second day of the battle, 19,000 soldiers crossed their land. There were somewhat, something like 9,000 casualties on their property. And I would say, now, I haven't done a farm-by-farm farm study through the entire history of the United States, but I'm going to strongly suggest that could be the bloodiest single farm in American history. According to a visitor to the farm afterwards, I was on the Rose Farm and around the Rose buildings immediately after hostilities ceased. It was about the most gruesome thing of the many gruesome spectacles on the Gettysburg field. The little marshy stream in front of the house was clogged with Confederate dead. When the heavy rains came down, so much was the flow of the water obstructed that great ponds were formed, the dams being the swollen corpses of the southern soldiery. The half of a body rent asunder by a spherical case was in the spring whence the Rose family obtained their drinking water. 
A much disgusted man was rose when he returned. His stock was gone. His furniture was gone. His house was filled with filthy clothing and vermin. His supply of drinking water polluted with dead bodies. Nothing left of his farm but the ground and some of the soil. Nearly a hundred Confederates were buried behind his garden. Some 175 behind his barn and around his wagon shed. Graves were scattered through the lawn adjoining the house, one Confederate colonel being buried within a yard of his kitchen door. No one farm on all the widely extended battlefield probably drank as much blood as did the Rose Farm. And here's a picture from the 1890s, I believe, of the Rose House, which still stands. And there are a lot of stories about the horrible nature of the battlefield after the fighting. And, of course, there is a series of photographs recorded by Alexander Gardner and his crew after the fighting showing dead on the battlefield um, and showing the burial crews. It took a whole week to bury the bodies, and some of you probably know that we have a national cemetery at Gettysburg dedicated four months after the battle where all the northerners are buried that were killed in the fighting. There are no Southerners officially buried in our cemetery. The Southerners were left out on these fields around the Rose Farm, buried in long trenches and unknown graves. It was not until 10 years later they attempted to recover the Southern bodies from the battlefield. Could they find their bodies 10 years later? No. And to this day, there are still Southerners buried out there in great quantities. And we argue about how many are still buried around the field. But the whole battlefield is like a cemetery for the soldiers involved in the fighting. And although other people want to deny it, the farmers in the area around the town know more than anyone that there are bodies still buried out there. So then it comes down to this basic question about the farmers. Do you plow your field after the battle's over? Interesting question. And I just wanted to end with this. This is Lorenzo Krauss. And again, you know, I stressed that it's not my objective to make the people who lived in Gettysburg sound like all heroines and heroes. But these people are in this unusual situation. And after the battle, both armies are gone. There are 20,000 wounded soldiers in and around the town. And When the men are not in the army, there's 2,000 people living in the town. Or, you know, in in the area, there's the farms around Gettysburg, there's a a number of people also. So let's say we had 3,000 people in the area, and there's 20,000 wounded soldiers. The armies pass through, they eat all the supplies, you know, there's no food, they drink all the water from the wells, and the railroad bridges are destroyed, And it's up to the citizens for the first few days to care for the soldiers, and they do the best they can. And you can imagine what the situation is. Immediately after the fighting, people come to the town. Some people come to help. They bring supplies, which is really good. Some people come to the town because they got a note that a relative had been wounded or killed in the fighting and are coming in to see what they can do to find their loved one's body or to try to nurse them back to health in one of the hospitals. The Philadelphia Inquirer has published casualty lists from the fighting on July 1st on July 4th. So they're coming into the town. But there's a third group of people coming into the town. The sightseers, the gawkers, the paparazzis. Lorenzo Crowns is a member of the New York Times. He comes into the town. We know absolutely nothing about what happened to him personally, but something angered him while he was in the town. And I always like to imagine something like this. He's a reporter, and he comes into the town on July 5th, and he knocks on somebody's door, and their house is filled with wounded. How do you feel? (laughs) Yeah. What kind of reception is he going to get? So he decided to take his little personal revenge on the Gettysburg townspeople. Let me read you what he wrote. Let me make it a matter of undeniable history 
that the conduct of the majority of male citizens of Gettysburg and the surrounding county of Adams is such as to stamp them with dishonor and craven-hearted meanness. I do not speak hastily, I but write the unanimous sentiments of the whole army, an army which now feels that the doors from which they drove a host of robbers, thieves, and cutthroats were not worthy of being defended. The actions of the people of Gettysburg are so sordidly mean and unpatriotic as to engender the belief that they were indifferent as to which party was whipped. On the street, the burden of the talk is their losses. And speculation as whether the government can be compelled to pay for this and that, almost entirely, they are uncourteous. But this is plainly from a lack of intelligence and refinement. I wish it to be understood that the facts I have stated can be fully substantiated by many officers high in rank as well as by what I personally saw and experienced. This is Adams County, a neighbor to Copperhead, York County, which is still near to stupid and stingy Berks County. Yeah. Anybody from Reading originally? <laughs> Obviously, Lorenzo Crowns is making a political comment about the people in South Central Pennsylvania not supporting the war effort in the way he would like and not about what the citizens in the town are doing to help the wounded. And it's very unfortunate because at the time of the Civil War, there's something called the Associated Press. And this article is picked up in virtually every newspaper in the North after the battle. And that's what people generally think of after the battle. That's what they generally know about the citizens of the town, that they were traitors. And even in recent books, people still find this article and cite this as evidence of the citizens' uh, participation in the fighting. Okay, well, I, want to thank, I want to thank everybody for listening to my lecture, and I'll answer some questions if you have questions. <laughs> Should we turn on the light so I can see who's asking? Okay, any questions? Oh, over here. And that's what can you tell us about the uh, farmers in the area of Maryland, Pennsylvania, uh, after the battle in which forces were yeah, um, you know, his horse was absconded to, you know, I, I always think it's interesting about the horses. Um, you know, when the Southern Army came through the area, obviously they were targeting horses. So, you know, horses are, you know, you think of it like this. You think of it like the fact that a soldier, what's a soldier make in the Civil War? Is it $13 a month? And a horse is valued at $200. You know, horses are a commodity. They're very valuable. And throughout the war, the Southerners, especially, you know, they don't have as many horses to replace their horses. So one of their major objectives is to gather horses as they march through South Central Pennsylvania. But also, the Northern Army uh, is, uh, you know, is taking horses. Uh, occasionally, they'll pay for them. The Confederates usually always paid in Confederate money. <laughs> And so horses, you know, are, are, if you have a horse, you want to hide it. And maybe not just from the southerners. But um, after the war's over, um, and I don't exactly know how it is for the people in Carroll County, but there is a process where you can make a claim to the federal government for damages that occurred to your property and your farm and horses taken uh, during the battle. Do you think that the local citizens were compensated for their loss of horses during the Gettysburg campaign? No. No. They tried to gain compensation. And actually, in Pennsylvania, uh, around the battlefield, virtually none of the civilians were compensated. Some people say, oh, yeah, they were comp." No, no. Sometimes they had bills for $800, and occasionally somebody would send a check for $10 to cover, like, something that they had a receipt for. But there was no compensation for the farmers because of their loss of uh, 
damage to their crops or their supplies or their horses. Question? Uh, what's your opinion on the theory that Richard Stoddard Yule was the cause of the loss for the South? I don't buy into it at all. It's, it's, you see, here's the problem with the, with the battle and causes of, the, of whose fault it is. You know, what happens is obviously the South lost. And after the war, it's almost like a sport in the South to direct blame towards one person or another. And you've got to understand that um, whether it's blaming Richard Yule for a supposed non-attack on the Culp's Hill on July 1st, or whether you blame Jeb Stewart because he's gallivanting around the Pennsylvania countryside and riding through Hanover, or whether you blame General Henry Heath for bringing on the battle before Lee was ready, or you blame General Longstreet for not attacking on the morning of July 2nd. These things are created after the war, and the whole emphasis of these arguments is to direct your attention away from someone else that may be responsible for ordering 12,000 men across the open field into artillery fire. <laughs> this is a southern protection of Robert E. Lee's legend. And so they get out of control in their you know, attempts to create scapegoats. So I, I'm very cautious when I read anything that criticizes someone else for the defeat. You know what, and also here's something else that's interesting about the battle, and this is just something we've, it's always been a factor, is that um, people tend to always talk about why the South lost. There's a great account by um, General Pickett's wife, LaSalle. She wrote a book on her husband, George Edward Pickett, who, was, of course, was the leader of the charge. And in this book, there's an account where, after the war, a newspaper uh, reporter visits uh, uh, General Pickett, and he goes through some of these things, and he explains each one to him, um, you know, uh, about Yule or Stuart or Longstreet or A.P. Hill not performing well or Lee possibly being sick during the battle. They threw that in there a lot. And then after he was done explaining all this stuff, he said, so General Pickett, why do you think the South lost the Battle of Gettysburg? And he said, I think the Yankees had something to do with it. <laughs> so I always, I always think in that, of that term, too, that sometimes we're so busy trying to figure out why they lost. I'll tell you why they lost. Because the Northern Army is on top of a hill behind a stone wall. And they have more cannons than the South does. <laughs> Yeah. Nope. He's yeah. There. I will strike him. Yeah. So Lee is very confident, maybe a little bit overconfident, but it's really tough. I mean, because you get people that you know, if you talk to people about Yule, that are just dead set against. Oh, they should have captured that hill. If Stonewall Jackson was alive, he and his men be sucking lemons on Cemetery Hill. Yeah. But I don't buy into the anti-Yule stuff at all. Well, great, great question. Any other questions? You know. Okay, go ahead. we'll let her. Can you talk briefly about um, how the town rebounded? What did yeah. they do? Well, yeah, well, yeah, this is interesting. And I think in the post-war era, when we have all these people visiting the town and they've read that nasty newspaper article about the citizens, well, I think their ideas of the citizens are only reinforced by what happens in the town after the fighting is over. What did I say about the town before the battle? We have hotels. And we have carriages. So after the battle, we, every man in town becomes a tour guide. <laughs> the tourists can stay in our hotels, and we put the tourists in wagons, and we charge them money to go around the battlefield, and we tell them stories. And that's what I do. <laughs> so the town, in that sense, is able to use the base that it already has to create one of the greatest commercial entities in the area, tourism and the battlefield. And everyone wanted to see the battlefield after the battle, just as they do today. So it's fascinating. Now, I know I'm out of time, but uh, if you want to, you can, you're welcome to walk up and ask me a question. Oh, we'll take one more. He's... Uh, I'm interested in what you had to say about horses. Uh -huh. Uh, an old Irish proverb says the outside of a horse is good for the inside of a man. I learned it from taking history in college. A local professor, Dr. Whitfield, expounded on 
I think about three days before, maybe a little longer than that, there were 5,000 horses and mules and wagons in Westminster. Now, a lot of people don't know that. I don't think the Historical Society has any old pictures of them loading supplies off of the Western Maryland Railroad cars to the horses to pull the wagons to Gettysburg, which is, what, 35 miles? Yeah. So, in other words, one, one of the reasons Lee invades the North, which are uh, without all hints at, is that one of the purpose of Lee invading the North is because the Northern Army has pre-established transportation routes to supply the Union Army while the Union Army is in Northern Virginia. So when the Southern Army invades Pennsylvania, General Meade's army has to turn and march in a direction they're not normally they're not used to moving in. And there are no established supplies and communications from Baltimore and Washington into this area. So they have to struggle to throw a supply system together. And at the end of the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union Army is basically out of supplies. So the railroad hub that ended here in Westminster, uh, or came to Westminster, you know, and then they took the wagons, took the supplies up the Baltimore Turnpike to the battlefield. I've never heard of any other railroads going into Gettysburg. Uh, there is another railroad, but the Confederates had destroyed it. The, the, the other railroad, if, and you know, I, I didn't bring, I often have a railroad map with me in my program, and I don't have it. I, I should have put that in. But the, um, there's a railroad called the Northern Central Railroad that comes out of Baltimore, Maryland, and it goes to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And at a place called Hanover Junction, there's a spur of the railroad that goes over through, you've probably been, it's not too far from Glen Rock, it, it goes over through Hanover and then runs to Gettysburg. Porter Siding. Um, is Porter Siding part of it? Yeah, Porter Siding, so the outskirts of Hanover. Oh, okay. It probably, yeah, probably does go through there then, yes. It's just, yeah, so that's um, later, yeah. Oh, no, no, the Western... The Western Maryland Railroad is at, um, I get it mixed up with the Maapa Railroad. That's probably which, that's a later railroad. But um, uh, this railroad ended in the town, our town, Gettysburg. But, um, uh, but that railroad had been destroyed by the Confederates during the invasion, and they couldn't use that railroad immediately. So they had to bring supplies up. Now, they did open up the railroad. There's another railroad that leads from Hanover to Littlestown. And they do have that open up after the battle, and then that's when the supply system changes from Westminster, and then the supplies start coming into Littlestown up that railroad. Um, and General Sickles, I believe, is transported out of there, for instance. But like General Reynolds, who was killed in the first day's battle, his body was taken to Union Bridge. And then it was put on the cars, sent to Baltimore, and then sent to Philadelphia, and then eventually buried in Lancaster. Because that's, you know... The Southerners were destroying the transportation system as they marched up. That was one of their goals, and they did a pretty good job. Okay. Well, if you have any more questions, just come on up afterwards. Yes. Not only that, the war, but the traveling of the West. Horse is important. Okay, thank you. Okay. That was really, really super, and we thank you so much, Tim. Um, I want to make sure I thank the Programs Committee for seeing to it that this all happened today, and the folks who baked all those lovely cookies and brownies and so forth. Just a reminder, on January 19th, we are having the county birthday, and again, this is produced by the Programs Committee headed by Marilyn Phillips. And Helen McSherry will be there to speak pastime life and love on the home front during the Civil War from 1861 to 65. So you all come. It's going to be over at uh, Holy Cross Hall at the Church of the Ascension and it will run from 2 to 4 and you can pick up a rack card up front. Everybody have a great Christmas and a Happy New Year and we'll see you again. <laughs>
in 2013. Thank you.